Hi, this is Deborah Danielson. Welcome to another Rebel Podcast episode where today we're going to talk about working with your family. I wanted to share some fond memories with all of our listeners today about working on family construction projects together. It started for me when I was a child, following my grandfather and my dad around the yard in the morning as they loaded up their floor sanding machines, their tool boxes, and their work shoes, and my grandma prepared lunches lovingly and popped them right into the truck so that they could be off. My Danish grandfather would whistle and sing as he rolled the heavy floor sanding equipment up the wooden plank into the old panel truck. Even though I was only five at the time, I thought the (laughs) smell of the sawdust, the varnish, and the turpentine were part of a normal daily routine for everyone. So I confidently skipped and sang behind my grandfather and my dad through their daily morning ritual. What peace and joy I felt inside my soul being part of this morning ritual. I was especially amazed to see the before and after results and photographs that my dad and my grandfather took of these projects. The pride I felt knowing my grandfather and my dad were talented and created beauty every day inspired me then and now. I believe I am addicted to wanting to make every space I am in beautiful and comfortable to live my best life. What about you? Have you ever worked on a project with your family? How did that turn out? What did you love most about it? What did you discover in hidden talents in your loved ones? Maybe some interesting family dynamics were brought to light. We would love to hear about your stories. Highlight the emotional connection in all of those kind of projects. It is a privilege to work alongside my family. On countless construction projects, we built more than just houses. We built memories that will last for generations. Now, what's also fun is sparking the curiosity about the shared experiences that you come up with. There's something truly special about working with family. The shared struggles, the unexpected laughs, the sense of accomplishment at the end of the long day, because boy, they can drag out, really creates a bond unlike any other. But what exactly makes these experiences so cherished? Well, for me, one of the highlights was the time we named my mom the stripper. It's a reminder that even the messiest of projects can become the funniest stories. So I also like to emphasize the emotional connection, the bonds that are built with working with my family. And even though my dad has passed away now and we no longer do projects together, as I'm working and doing projects now, all those memories come flooding in and they inspire me and motivate me and put a big smile on my face every day that I work on another project. And I believe that my dad is looking down and he's just still proud that his traditions and all the things he's taught me to do are still carried on. Think about that for your family. What is being carried on working with your family? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so you might be wondering what's going on here. Uh, No, I'm not mad at Wayland, and no, (laughs) this isn't the end of our podcasting relationship. But what this is, we thought we would share this with you because it's one of those Victorian parlor pieces of furniture that you very seldom see anymore and very few people know even what this is. But this is called a tete-a-tete. And I think that's French. Mm -hmm. And what happened was is when 
you know, you were in a proper family, whatever that means, and your beau or suitor would come calling, you would have to sit in these chairs that are, you can see, this is how you normally sit in it, like this. So I could look at Waylon and I could talk to you, but the point was, you weren't touching anything. <laughs> <laughs> you can't touch the goodies. <laughs> right, yeah. So we wanted to share this with you. So honestly, have you ever said it a tete-a-tete? -tete? I don't think so, no. But so I what's like your it. impression? I love it. I think it's and it's actually pretty comfortable too for Victorian furniture. I know. It and really is. And it's good for conversation like this. Because if you're sitting on a love seat yes. like next to each other, then you can't really look each other in the eyes or right. you know, it hurts your neck. Yeah. But here's what's interesting. I didn't realize this until just this moment, but you could still kiss this way. You could. But I don't know if that was acceptable. I think it wasn't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were so Puritan, you know, I don't know what the right word is, but they were so involved in their Puritan ethics, maybe, mm. or culture, that I don't believe it was proper to kiss, but here's what I bet. I bet they snuck a kiss the minute the mom or the dad. Yeah, I'm 99% sure that they did. Had to leave the room <laughs> for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe that's why so many people just hurried into marriage because they got a little hot and bothered. Yeah, it was the only thing you could do was to get married and so you could uh and be miserable. Right, yeah. <laughs> to find out <clears throat> only to find out like after the kiss or after the whatever, it really wasn't worth it. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a fun thing and I can understand why this piece of furniture really has gone by the wayside. I don't think you're gonna find it on Wayfair or No on Amazon. If you do, it'll be like a, a quick closeout special. <laughs> <laughs> I do love it though. I especially love the carved heads. And yeah, the, this is a very nice one. And we have um, full carved features of, I think it's a female. I'm not sure what it, looks it is. looks almost like a Dutch boy or I'm not sure. I think they're they're unidentifiable and sexually, <laughs> that's what they are. They're so it impressive. could go either way. Yeah. <laughs> Which is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, this one's carved. We have uh, padded velvet seats. Mm -hmm. So they are very comfortable. They are, even for me, I'm, you know, six foot five. This is not. And you, you look all. totally proportionate on it. Yeah. Yeah. Look over here. And I don't think the Victorian people at the end of the day were very large they were cut more short i think well yeah you can tell by like the beds and oh yeah like, i don't think they're some of them aren't even six feet no long, they're so, not yeah you might have a problem at my guest house <laughs> probably yeah <clears throat> <laughs> so the guest house is my airbnb and i have one two three four beds that are actually vintage and all the mattresses had to be handmade. So thank God, right here in Omaha, Nebraska, we have a company that hand makes mattresses. They come out to your house, they measure them, and then they make the mattress and the box spring to fit. Wow, I didn't even know that we had that available. Uh, it's part of the Berkshire Hathaway. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's amazing, and I feel blessed that I could buy these beds in their 100% original state. Mm -hmm. So when you come to our Airbnb, you can have the privilege of actually experiencing sleeping on a bed with a handmade mattress and box spring that's 100% original. So you can get the real flavor of how life was back then. Well, that, the you know, the surroundings of that house mm -hmm. just are incredible the stained glass and all the wood detail and the staircase alone is just yeah mind-blowing the staircase that used to be covered up with um i don't even know it was like some kind of makeshift drywall and they put apartments around the staircase so 
it looked more like a hallway that just went up somewhere. <laughs> he yeah. didn't know where it was going. <laughs> <laughs> and when I bought the house, the, the uh, main uh, sewer pipe in the house was made out of cast iron, which was in this house too. And cast iron only has a shelf life of 100 years. Did you know that? Only 100? Only 100. <laughs> so when you get a house like this, it's 148 or the house across the street, which is roughly 130, yeah. you got a problem. Yeah, it needs replaced for sure. And I remember the day my dad and I first walked in that house, just scoping it out like it was up for sale. And it was a problem house because it was a seven plex and nobody, nobody had any money. So they, they were just struggling to barely get by no air conditioning in the house. The house had never been air conditioned. It had never had an upgrade to the plumbing. And the last plumbing that had been put in was in World War I. Oh my God. I know. And they used steel pipes because they couldn't get the copper because that was being used for right. bombs and yeah. whatnot. <laughs> so, and then steel, the interesting thing about steel water pipes, go over and turn the faucet on and if it's been 20 years or more very soon you'll find out that the water flow gets down to a drip and then it goes away oh. because inside the steel it's constantly corroding and it collapses in on itself so literally when we had to take those pipes out we had to knock holes in the wall <laughs> tear out the plumbing that's expensive even if you do it yourself. And so the pipes were 100% clogged. So think of it like your arteries in your body. When you get a clog in an artery, the whole body shuts down. Right, yeah. The whole house shut down over there. But the reason I bought the house is because the landlord didn't take care of it. It's right across the street from our house and he was actually renting an apartment up on the fourth floor of this house and the, no water could get through. There was a kitchen, he could say it had a kitchen, but there was no water because guess what? It had steel pipes. Their water did work for the bathtub and the toilet, but if you were trying to do anything beyond that, no. Hmm. But they were charging people to live in that. And I just felt it was horrible. So I thought what we would talk about today is working with your family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going through all of this stuff, I can still remember the day my dad and I first walked through that house, seeing the sewage water lines where it had been dripping and running down the walls. It was black. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the walls were sort of that off-white, beigey, horrible color that, that you know, Maybe people slap yeah. on just to cover stuff <laughs> up. Contractor gray. There you yeah. go. Yeah, it was that horribleness. So when you walked in, you felt like you needed a full-body condom on. It was like, <laughs> ooh, I don't want to touch it. <laughs> now, most people would probably run away from that. So that's mm -hmm. amazing that you, you know, had the vision to, to do something like that. Well, it wasn't that I really wanted it. It's that it sat right across the street from my house. Right. And I had put so much investment into fixing this house that if I didn't do something over there, I was SOL. Yeah. And since we don't really swear on this podcast, you'll have to look up SOL. You can <laughs> Google it. <laughs> Probably in the Urban Dictionary. Too. It's in the Urban Dictionary. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you use the Urban Dictionary a lot, or am I the only one? When I'm bored, I'll sometimes just uh, look through it just to see what the word of the day is, because I'm like, huh, oh, I've never heard that before. I haven't done that yet. Really? <laughs> so what's yeah. the word for today, do you know? I don't think I can say it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, be sure to look it up. Okay, I will. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I so when I walked in the house over there that first day with my dad, here's my fond memory. 
Uh, my dad and I both knew instantly that that was sewer water because the sewer pipe had, the main sewer pipe had cracked. The stack. The stack had yeah. cracked. There we go, a new round. Crack stack. The stack has cracked. <laughs> no, going back. That's right. <laughs> so anyway, um, I look at the man who was selling the house. His name was Roy. And Roy, I said, what is all of this stuff? coming down and it was coming down from three floors and you could see it you know as you wind, wound up this staircase that was buried under drywall and he goes oh that's nothing it's probably just sweat and as you becoming a real estate agent mm -hmm. you know that that's not a good practice right to lie and misrepresent the other tactic he pulled was when he knew that I would be the best possible liar because of the investment I had put in this house. And, you know, there was always police over there. There was always issues. So here we go. I said to Roy, when we got all done with the house, looked at everything, the, none of the systems had been updated. So we had a sevenplex with one water heater in it. We're not talking instantaneous water heater here. Think of the old fashioned 25 year old water heater. Right. <laughs> Those poor people that were living there, can you imagine? They, they were miserable. You said the police were called there all the time. I, if I lived there, I'm sure I would be angry. <laughs> On edge. <laughs> yeah, on edge too. Yeah. The police would probably be called on me. I was on edge just walking in there. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. Sewer water. And... Oh my God. Yeah. And I just, you know, when you have that color paint, everybody knows that color, right? It's like the dingy white Yeah. that you know that people just spray just, paint they it paint on. They paint the outlets, they paint the, oh, yeah. the woodwork. Know, yeah, the windows are all painted shut. It's just awful. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what was going on. So by the time we made it out to the backyard, I said, well, I know you're asking 150 grand for this house, but I think I, the most I can give you is like 100. Oh no, you know what he did? What? He already had another couple lined up, which later I found out were friends. But also investors, what kind of investors? Slumlord investors. Oh, sure. Yeah. Not, not investing in a property to bring it up, to make it livable and healthy and a place where people of moderate means could live. But that now we're talking bottom of the barrel, right? So it was gonna be the same as it was or worse. It was, was going to degrade. So uh, I realized soon quickly that I had to do what I had to do and bite the bullet and prices of real estate at that moment especially in this area were extremely low and just to give you an idea when I bought my house I paid fifty thousand dollars for it so to turn around <laughs> a few years later and get a house actually smaller than this house and pay three times more for it was like, are you serious? It was like that moment. But I bought it and I worked really, really hard to pay for it. And then I tried to keep some of the residents in there, but that didn't work out too well because I had rented to somebody who was on a presidential campaign and the first 24 hours she was there, she clogged the, the toilet up on the second floor and overflowed all the effluent, which is short for S-H-I-T. And it went all down to the first floor and wiped out two apartments down there. Oh no. Yeah. So it was a mess and she never paid a rent and yeah. It was $10,000 worth of damage. 
So shortly thereafter, I decided that having to renovate and everything else, that I would just shut her down, make it into a, turn it back into a single family residential home. So my dad and I sit down and my mom, and we talked about it and how we would do it. And since we had been working over here, it just seemed like water off a duck's back. Hey, this is doable, right? But the problem is that house was in way worse condition than this house. Mm -hmm. And it took three times the amount of money to fix all that plumbing. Why is that? Because I had to take out seven kitchens. I had to take out seven bathrooms. And then I had to redo the bathrooms for a single family home. So by the time I was done, the plumbing bill was more than most people paid for a house. Wow. It was horrible. I'm sure. Although I will say with what you've done to it, it's, I mean, it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> Bedroom or a bathroom up off the hallway um, upstairs. That has some of the original tile. I love that bathroom. I could just spend the day in there. The I bathroom. love, I yeah. love that bathroom. It's so beautiful. Yeah. You just kind of feel like, give me a bottle of champagne, turn mm -hmm. on some great music, let's a get some, bath, yeah, candle a light, face mask, and get out of my face. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Be like heaven for a day. Yeah. And uh, my first guest came a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. How did that go? They were awesome. I loved all of these people. Um, one was for Berkshire, the other was to go to the opera. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the one came from Germany, Cologne, Germany. But I was just really enjoying all of them. And it was a lot of fun. And we have more guests coming. But I sort of thought to myself, geez, I'm going to be like Lisa Vanderpump of Council Bluffs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you will. And I think my mom and dad, um, you know, would be really pleased to know that all that hard work and effort paid off. And I know you've been working with your family a lot mm -hmm. and that you probably have special little memories. Oh yeah. We have a little private joke that we came up with. Dad, they spray paint everything. Mm -hmm. My mom became our stripper. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when people would say, well, what do you do? She goes, I'm a stripper. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you think? What, do you have any special memories to share? Oh my gosh, so many. I mean, oh, so most recently I've been helping my parents with their house in Iowa. And um, they live in a small town northeast of here. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been uh, working on restoring it. I uh, redid their floors in their dining room. And Those turned out beautiful. Thank you. That was kind of the first uh, time I really refinished a floor from start to finish. So. It was, it turned out really well for my first time. It's a I, lot of work too. It was, yeah. Definitely get an arm workout <laughs> with yeah. the sander. Um, but we've always, when I was a kid, we built a house. Uh, not meaning we actually you know, built it from like the basement to the top, but my parents had someone build it. And we, um, to save money, did a lot of it. Um, like we stained all the woodwork and mm -hmm. finished it, things like that. I think we even did the painting um, on the inside too. But I remember doing that as as a kid. Us kids were not very thrilled to be spending our summer vacation doing that. But um, but look at what you learned. Yeah, and looking back on that, I can always I always have those skills. I can always like if everything just goes you know tease up. Yeah. Um, I can always paint or. I think know. that's in the urban dictionary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can, but I can always use those skills to earn a living. So it's. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll always, and those memories are priceless. Right. Doing that stuff, I'll always right. remember that. So now you look at my floors in here and they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. But I was remembering, speaking of floor sanding, as you were talking, I was remembering back when we first bought this house. Once we pulled up the carpet from 1970, Right, and this was 1992 I bought the house. <laughs> I'm sure it was beautiful. Oh, it was <laughs> wonderful. A wonderful avocado shag. It was that, yep. Was exactly. it? 
And so we piled it up outside and it was piled way high. It piled all the way to the second floor. But here's what was interesting. I love the floor under it. And it was very narrow, white quarterson oak. But my dad said, oh no, Deborah, these are not good floors. I go, oh my God, why? They're beautiful. He said, because they're veneer. Oh. And these were put in during like World War II. And so, because the house never, because these people were rich that built this house, Rich people showed up by having carpeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but unfortunately, that beautiful carpeting was long gone and I had 1970. So when we tore up the carpeting, at some point, somebody had put down this, what would be equivalent to laminate flooring today, um, but it was a very thin veneer. So instead of being three quarter inch solid oak, it was, maybe a quarter inch. And you can't really refinish that, it's just... That's what he told me, yeah. you can't refinish it. And I thought, well, by God, I'm gonna get out the Murphy soap and I'm gonna clean this pig up, right? Make, <laughs> make it look good. Well, my kids would come in here, they were little, so Ashley and Farrah would come in here. They'd be in here playing, and then all of a sudden I'd hear, ow! And Splitters. screaming, and so, yeah, I can't tell you there were at least 10 times that the floor started splintering, like disintegrating oh. from having air on it and being clean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened then was they, they would walk across it in their bare feet and the splinter would go right into the foot. Oh. So there we would be digging out splinters. So I'm like, yeah, we can't do that. So I'm just like, yeah, now it's, Time to put the new floors down. Well, I always admire your floors every time I'm here. It's just incredible. I can't believe your dad did all of this. I know you told me somebody saw this and wanted him, they were going to hire him and pay him a huge amount of money to do. Yeah, we, we have often opened our house for tours, you know, for um, either the school districts or some local organization that was doing fundraising. And the last tour we had, there were 750 people who came in that day. It was exhausting. But it was like the more people came in from the Lewis Central School District and all their friends, they would call more friends, which is good because then it raised more money for the school. But the problem was, <laughs> you know, that's a lot of people to put in here, right? Yeah. Thank you for watching the Rebel Podcast today. I hope you enjoyed this episode and looking back at wonderful projects I've been working on with my family and the fond memories we have. Please watch, subscribe, and share. Thank you so much. Now go and glow.